Buenos días. Eh, la mi presentazione va a raíz in inglese. Eh, Potevo parlare un idioma che è una mescla tra italiano e spagnolo, però vi evitai questa eh, cosa e quindi va a essere traduzita da, con molta gentilezza, molto kind, eh, di Pedro. First of all, I really would like to express my gratitude to be here today. It's really an amazing event. I have experienced similar events in the US, but I just um, I am highly impressed of um, you know, the, the number of people that attended this uh, special day and uh, the quality of you know, the content and the description of the status of the art of the precision agriculture in Argentina. Quisiera agradecer la invitación y señalar que estoy muy impresionado por el tipo de eh, con, por el Congreso y si bien ha estado en algunos similares en Estados Unidos, está impresionado por la convocatoria y la cantidad de eh, personas que atienden. So the objective of my presentation is I will not present the state of the art of precision agriculture in the US. There will be many other people, better people that can represent the status, you know, the state of the art of precision agriculture. But I would really like to share with you something that is at the heart, uh, not just my heart, at the heart of precision agriculture how precision agriculture can really make a difference and how decision can be made based on uh, spatial variability assessment. Ok, lo que quisiera señalar eh, no es el estado del arte, lo más avanzado en la tecnología, sino algo que se ubica en el corazón de esto, que es cómo eh, la agricultura de precisión puede contribuir y cómo debe moverse para mejorar la As uh, you all agree, most of the spatial variability is highly related to variability in climate. And so the main uh, core of my presentation deals with how climatic variability is taken into account when you select a particular management option. And in my case, most of the examples will deal with nitrogen fertilizer. Lo importante es que la variabilidad espacial está muy relacionada, tiene muchas interacciones con la variabilidad climática y su interés particular es demostrar cómo esto ocurre principalmente con la fertilización nitrogenada. So when we talk about variability, we have two basically domain, two, two areas where one is spatial variability and one is temporal variability. And just recently temporal variability has become much more important because people are realizing that they can understand the space partially because this space changes over time. So the spatial maps may never be the same because of this temporal variability mainly driven by variability in climate. La variabilidad en general es el resultado de dos tipos de variabilidad, una variabilidad espacial y una variabilidad temporal que interactúa con la espacial. Entonces, el, la, la dificultad, en, esta, es fácil comprender la extensión de la variabilidad espacial, pero a lo largo del tiempo esta parece ir cambiando por el aporte de años distintos que generan diferencias en las zonas espaciales. So, a spatial variability, there are properties that affect the behavior, and some of those properties are called static property. That means they only change over space, but over time they're always the same. So one, the best example is soil texture. In our lifetime, we will never see a sandy soil becoming a clay soil unless you are in a major erosion area. So soil texture, pH, They are highly variable over space, but they do not vary over time. Muchas de las variables espaciales son estáticas y no cambian en periodos de tiempo de una vida. Por ejemplo, la textura. Nosotros podemos ver que 
la textura o el pH tiene una variabilidad espacial grande, pero es improbable que en un sitio la textura cambie de manera rápida. Un suelo arcilloso no se va a convertir en arenoso, salvo que haya un proceso erosivo. So the difficulties in assessing the causes of the variability mainly deal with variables that they are called dynamic. And for example, back on the, on the pH, if you know that one area of the field has a low acid pH and soybean does not fix you know, nitrogen well under acid condition, all you have to do is go and put lime and that's a static property and you may have solved your problem. But most of the variability deals with dynamic properties which are dependent on, var on climate, for example, soil water content. It varies from this point to this point and from today versus tomorrow in the next days. And this varies over a long period of time. One year you will have a wet year and another year you'll have a dry year. So that complicates the, the, the things. Entonces, la gran parte de la dificultad en la agricultura de precisión consiste en poder medir las variables que son dinámicas. Porque, por ejemplo, nosotros podemos determinar en las variables de tipo estática, espaciales, como el pH, que una zona, por ejemplo, de pH bajo, eh, es fácil de corregir con, un, con una aplicación de un corrector de pH si uno sabe que eso afecta a la soja porque no hay fijación. Pero las variables dinámicas son complicadas porque no solo, por ejemplo, el contenido de agua puede cambiar de un punto del, del potrero a otro eh, por una cuestión espacial, sino que cambian de un día para otro por el efecto temporal. And then there is basically temporal variability, it's just the changes over time when you accumulate a series of yield maps and then you start to see how important is this analysis that those spatial patterns are never the same. Cuando uno acumula una secuencia de mapas de variables espaciales e intenta extraer información, llega a advertir cómo los patrones espaciales van cambiando a lo largo del tiempo. So, someone before me has uh, basically said that the spatial variability is the norm rather than the exceptions. But we just at the moment, in many cases, we still ignore it. So I believe that the success of precision agricultural application, it's not just you know, having very precise machinery, but also trying to make decision where the machinery makes your life simpler. And that depends first on how accurate is your assessment of the variability. That's the first point. Then the most important things is what about the prescription when you go to the doctor you just you have to help the doctor identify your problems if you have headache and you tell him that you have a stomach pain he'll give you a product for the stomach pain you you get sick from that product and you still have the headache so that becomes the adequacy of the input of recommendation basically the agronomy the agronomy is far behind the engineering but We're trying to catch up. And the degree of application control. It's basically how precise are the machines. Yeah, but that can be summarized. Okay, I think I'm going to interrupt you a bit more often. Look at the slide. <laughs> eh, el, la variabilidad espacial es más la norma que, que la excepción. Y el gran problema que existe es cómo, eh, cuán precisa es la, la, la capacidad de diagnóstico de la variabilidad. Daba un ejemplo que, que uno puede ir al médico y la prescripción eh, está dada por la calidad del diagnóstico y uno por ahí le da una medicina para resolver un problema y no resuelve el problema principal. Y esto ocurre lo mismo aquí. Y una vez que tengamos una prescripción derivada de un diagnóstico correctamente hecha, el problema que sigue es cuán eh, precisa y de qué calidad es la aplicación de esta prescripción. You have seen it already and you deal a lot with those called management zone, zona de manejo. Pero it's, it's basically you can give different you know, definition, but ideally is a zones where you can apply this input in a different, uh, in different manner, trying to optimize both you know, the economics and the environmental aspect. Sí, eh, normalmente la manera de actuar es determinar zonas de manejo o lo que llamamos acá a veces ambientes 
y tratar de determinar un, una, un paquete de medidas de manejo que sean óptimas para cada zona de manejo determinada, como zonas que son uniformes y responden siempre de igual manera dentro de sí mismas. So, there is, there is a very rich literature in science on how different zones are created. You can use, as Jose mentioned, position in the landscape, it, it just, it's always highly correlated to the spatial variability because obviously different behavior of water, you know, water running off or a, a lack of water. Soil type, nutrient levels, what, what I believe is extremely important is this collection of yield maps over time. Uh, electrical conductivity, both remote sensing and proximal sensing, and, and very, very important, not, you know, last but not least, is the producer experience. Hay, existen una serie de herramientas para mapear las zonas de manejo. Eh, típicamente la topografía tiene una relación generalmente muy fuerte con la, los ambientes. Eh, él considera que es particularmente importante el uso de mapas de rendimiento, pero también otras variables como la conductividad eléctrica o el resultado de muestreos en grilla que permitan hacer mapas de otras variables. So, people have associated, um, you know, this 4R. That, that terminology is becoming more popular nowadays in the US, even in the common language. Uh, basically do the, you know, the, apply the right, right input, right amount, right time, right place. And that's a definition that we all know, basically try to optimize both, you know, the economics and the environmental aspects. Lo que se busca es eh, aplicar de manera correcta lo que se está popularizando, que es las cuatro R's, que es el... El, 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 el input correcto, la cantidad correcta, al tiempo correcto y en el lugar correcto. So, what has changed in this uh, 24 years of uh, when precision agriculture came out? Actually, you have one, one of the speakers is probably one of the first that ever collected a yield map uh, in, uh, in the world. So, uh, in 1990s, um, the technology was becoming available, but it was really not immature, as you would say. They, there was an emphasis on assessing the spatial variability because of the sensors that we had, and obviously there was a lack in the temporal analysis because you didn't have you know, a series of maps. Um, so it was obviously, but even by definition, and you know, appealing and environmental benefit because you could potentially put the right amount without you know, having any waste. So that was the, the ideal situation and sensors became available. Él se pregunta, ¿qué ha cambiado en estos veintitantos años desde que se generó el primer mapa de rendimiento del cual probablemente él haya, él haya sido el artífice del primero. No, 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 yo. <risa> el profesor ah, del... ah, alguna otra persona aquí, disculpe. Eh, y el, eh, lo, que, lo que sí ocurre es que lo que ha cambiado es que la colección de una, una gran cantidad de años ha mejorado mucho la posibilidad inicial, que era el concepto comprendido entonces de que la variabilidad iba a permitir la adjudicación de recursos de manera más óptima. Pero no se sabía bien eh, si esto iba a poder hacerse hasta ahora que hay mucha más información acumulada. So now what do we have, what has changed? Basically we have an amazing amount of information that you may have heard, the so-called big data. I mean we have got more data that we can handle. The technology is so precise, so advanced. People start realizing how important is the temporal variability you know, that, that's becoming greater than spatial variability. What is still limited is the knowledge of the response of an input because it's never assessed within a system. You do not know if you apply a different input, what would be the response unless you know the system so well. And that's basically the core of my presentation. How could we simulate the response of the input with a high level of confidence that it will make a difference in the decision if you know, the model reproduces what you have observed over these so many years of time. And so 
the ecosystem services is not just production. Most of the producers just care, have, have an interest in, in making higher profit. But one of the main advantages is also to not, not try not to pollute the environment. So, but to do this, you need to have, keep in mind that there needs to be a change in scales from management zones to very fine scale, depending on what you're dealing with. Eh, la, la cantidad de información que hemos acumulado ahora es enorme, pero lo crucial es poder relacionar de manera correcta los, la, la, la cantidad y la dosis de los recursos que se aplican y conocer el sistema tan bien o con tanto detalle que la predicción de las respuestas sea realmente bien conocida. Y eso es el centro de su presentación, de explicar cómo los sistemas que existen hoy pueden predecir de manera precisa la respuesta ante la aplicación de recursos distintos. Porque no solo es importante el rendimiento, sino también conocer el sistema y los impactos ambientales y además el impacto económico que es generalmente lo que más preocupa al productor. Well, the reason I said the, about the environmental impact, because in many places that is a priority, uh, especially like in, under European uh, laws and nowadays even in the US. So the environment is important. Uh, I guess it will, be, it will become just as important if not already in Argentina as well. El, eh, hace énfasis en, el, en el, la, la administración de, de recursos por la cuestión del impacto ambiental porque en muchos países es una prioridad. No es tanta la prioridad del rendimiento del productor, sino evi poder producir evitando el impacto ambiental, cosa que es muy común en Europa y ahora está creciendo esa preocupación en Estados Unidos. So I'll, I'll move a little bit faster. Huh? Um, basically, the change in scale of what we can manage, obviously we can manage a single plant. There will be fantastic you know, examples of managing, you know, basically killing a single weed uh, or a tree in horticultural crops. There's quite a bit of that application in the US for high commodity prices. Uh, trees, field variability on a farm, catchment on larger area and landscape. So, That change in scale is important. You, sometimes you, you may have to make a decision in, in space in selecting the appropriate inputs from the single plant to a much larger landscape in terms of selecting the proper cultivars or, or even the proper different species on a large sí, scale. El nivel de decisiones que hay que tomar depende un poco de la escala y a veces hay que extrapolar desde las respuestas estudiadas de la planta individual o en el caso de la horticultura. Eh, lo que se está estableciendo ahora es el estudio de plantas, de árboles individuales, y, pero en la escala es muy importante para relacionar con el tipo de decisión que uno puede tomar, porque no es lo mismo la planta individual que a nivel de lote, que a nivel regional, por ejemplo, una cuenca. So, I guess you don't need to see this, this is much better to go outside, but auto tracking and nowadays auto steering are some of the technology that has made all basically what we do possible, the presence of a very high precise GPS and be able to you know, monitor things as you go. So the real-time management, that's just has been a very important uh, technology as well as precision planting and you know, planting uh, different cultivars and so on. So the machinery aspect is it's a given. Sí, la parte mecánica está básicamente resuelta y disponemos de máquinas lo suficientemente precisas y de calidad para hacer las aplicaciones con el nivel de precisión adecuado en todas las escalas. So the problem is when you start dealing with these things. Any farmers in the US, like here, do not make decision very much, very, very little on yield maps. And so they call it, you know, nice refrigerator art. You know, you print the map, you put it on the wall, you look at it, it looks very nice, what do I do with it? Nothing. So just recently, an interesting story, a multinational, very big company was approached by a very large group of, it's a story that you can translate easily, a very large group of farmers, and they said, you either help us um, understanding the yield maps, or we may stop collecting it, because we don't do anything. I, they say, I have personally like 18 years of yield maps, maybe 10 of very, very high quality, I never do, I don't implement any change. So this company contacted the universities in many places in the US and they were asked to write a proposal to see how we could help, you know, farmers in assessing this. 
So long story short, just the proposal of Michigan State was funded, my proposal, and so I'll tell you the story behind that, what we do. La historia es importante. <laughs> Dice que la mayoría de, de los eh, agricultores en Estados Unidos han conseguido recolectar mapa de rendimiento, oh, oh. recolectar mapa de rendimiento y hacer lo que llaman linda, oh, lindos dibujitos. Oh, 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 oh. Hola, 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 hola. Disculpen, no somos ninguno de nosotros. Entonces, eh, comentaba que eh, después de muchos años de recolectar mapa de rendimiento, mucha gente lo único que ha conseguido son lindas imágenes para pegar en la ladera. Es decir, que la mayoría de los agricultores recogen mapa de rendimiento, pero no toman decisiones oh, oh, de manejo. Oh, oh. Eh, no toman decisiones de manejo a partir de ellos. Entonces, recientemente, eh, un grupo de agricultores muy grande solicitó a una corporación importante de servicios agrícolas que, bueno, o, o bien ustedes nos enseñan a utilizar los mapas de rendimiento para tomar decisiones, o bien vamos a dejar de recolectarlos, porque llevamos 18 años tomándolos y no los estamos usando. Entonces, la Universidad del Michigan State uh, hizo una de las propuestas que fue aceptada para generar información a los agricultores que les permita tomar decisiones a partir de la información y no solamente tener lindas, lindos gráficos. So, one of the first things we do when we look at this yield map, obviously you see, sometimes you can distinguish a pattern, but if every year it's a complete story. How could a farmer use any of those maps to make a change. Ustedes pueden ver que los mapas son muy distintos de un año para otro, entonces realmente no hay no hay como un agricultor normal sin experiencia pueda tomar una decisión cuando la variabilidad de un año a otro es tan grande. So what what do you think the variable that affects that yield map is? It's obviously weather driven, depending on how much rainfall you get, how much is how it is distributed. And it's, it is also related to some of the inputs, but mostly is weather. Eh, evidentemente, si todos los años tenemos mapas de rendimiento que son muy distintos y el espacio no cambió, la causa principal de cambio de un año a otro está eh, mediada por el clima. Puede ser que en algunos casos haya variabilidad inducida por el manejo, pero principalmente es la meteorología, la distribución y la cantidad de las lluvias en primer término. So when you start looking at these maps in this way, you see the distribution and you see that in 2012, which obviously was a very dry year, there were areas of the field where just didn't collect just about anything, you know, four tons versus nine, when in 2011, the farmers could collect as high as 15 tons per hectare rain fed. Ustedes pueden ver que en un año muy seco como el 2012, el rango eh, termina eh, el rango máximo de producción termina para el mismo lote donde comienza para un año con buenas lluvias. So, a, a normal procedure that we use often in science, we try to understand how the maps are different from the spatial side versus how different are over time. So, we create a spatial variability map and a temporal variability map. Entonces, la manera, eh, aquí lo que importa para conocer el efecto de la variable temporal es separar de los mapas el efecto espacial del efecto temporal. Entonces, el, el eh, enfoque es generar un mapa de variabilidad espacial y un mapa de variabilidad temporal donde las dos cosas estén separadas. And then create stable zones. The reason we create these stable zones are then because then we execute the system, which is basically a model that reproduces the variability first, has to have a strong testing component. Once the testing is sufficiently you know, acceptable, then you start running scenario to see the response of the input on each of the zones. And then I will show some examples on farm, these are all farmers field, and what the response of those inputs were The farmer just didn't, didn't know. Entonces, la, lo que se busca es, hacer, es generar zonas de, que se conozcan que son lo suficientemente estables 
como para que el estudio de la respuesta para eh, la aplicación de recursos ahí valide y el, el, lo que se hace y el productor comprenda con claridad cuál es el efecto de hacer cada cosa en cada una de las zonas. So when you pick a year like this, 2011, the farmer obviously was happy because even if he had red zones, were less, but he still made a profit. Okay, so he made a significant profit because there was also a very high price. If you look at 2012, that same field basically lost quite a bit of money. That area is about maybe 30, 40 acres, and so that's a significant amount of loss. Sí, lo que al productor le interesa ver muchos, en muchos casos es, es ver en qué parte del lote ha conseguido ganar plata o no. Entonces, eh, la, el, el poder validar el efecto de, de un manejo determinado de manera variable tiene mucho impacto al productor cuando el productor ve en qué porcentaje o qué proporción del lote ganó o perdió dinero. So here we, we started implementing the simulation in a real time. So we ran the model and, and basically asked the question, since we knew it was, it was dry, it did not have any water in the profile, if it does not put nitrogen in the area where they normally do, unfortunately in the US they put them the nitrogen one time, sometimes all in the fall, just unacceptable, or sometimes at planting. So, The message to take home from this presentation is you need to do in-season management. Only if you do in-season management, then you get the big bucks. Okay, entonces, el, la, el resultado de, de óptimo es hacer, tomar las decisiones de manejo durante el ciclo del cultivo. Él señala que en Estados Unidos es bastante común que se haga una sola aplicación de nitrógeno a la siembra o inclusive en el otoño, lo cual es inaceptable. Entonces, lo que ellos han hecho es que han tomado las zonas de manejo definidas y han simulado con un, eh, con un software de simulación de rendimientos que demuestra cuál es el efecto de aplicar el nitrógeno de una manera u otra en distintos momentos. So, by running, uh, only putting 30 pounds, which is equal to about 30 kilograms per hectare, he, he would have made a significant amount of money. Then the second question is, He, this farmer does not irrigate, but he was thinking about in the future, uh, there is a tendency in the US in digging down and trying to get the irrigation system going. So he said, how much more would I make if I irrigate? You know, most of the times he makes money because it rains a lot. It rains five to 600 millimeters, well distributed. He has a good soil and so on. But if we wanted to know how much money he made if he were to irrigate, That's the, the amount that it would get. Entonces con los modelos de simulación lo que consiguen es simular qué ocurre con una dosis particular y ver en qué porcentaje del lote el, eh, es rentable o no esa aplicación. O en el caso como este que él puede decidir colocar un círculo de riego, eh, simular la aplicación de agua y determinar si esa aplicación de agua es rentable o no es rentable en relación a la inversión que el productor puede hacer. So the system we use is called SALUS, System Approach for Land Use Sustainability. It's basically, it's developed by Joe Ritchie, professor at Michigan State, and I. Joe Ritchie retired, so I have he inherited all the responsibilities, the good and the bad of the model. And the model is an evolution of a very well-known uh, um, crop model called the Sirius model, which was developed with funding of the United States International Foreign Service in the 70s to predict how much uh, wheat was produced in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So the model has been around for more than 30 years. And I'll come back to this. I just wanted to show the validation of how extensive validation the model has had throughout the continent. The dots are not very clear. But this review only shows basically where measured data and simulated data were present and what was the, the level of accuracy. So Sirius was a well-established model and Salus includes a lot of changes that, were, that I will explain in a minute. Is, is this model validation for Salus or Sirius? 
uh, that series. Ah, okay. El, el modelo eh, fue desarrollado por la Universidad de Michigan bajo la dirección del profesor Richie y el señor Vaso y es, eh, está derivado de un modelo eh, muy conocido de simulación de cultivos que se desarrolló en la década del 70 que se llamó CERES y que el mapa que mostró eh, es la validación internacional que se hizo del CERES donde se simularon cultivos y además se levantaron datos de rendimiento para estudiar el ajuste que tenía. So the changes from Ceres to Salus is Salus is designed first of all to simulate the newest cultivars. So we do not simulate a single plant, but we simulate the, the density of plants which account for prolificity like, you know, two years or barrenness or skips in the plant. In addition to that, there are many new algorithms that deal with the water balance, the possibility of accounting the surface uh, condition, if it's wet, transpiration is affected, where most of the other models do not account for surface conditions. So basically it was designed with all the improvements that did not go into series, that model remained pretty much in the, in the initial stage of that, about 20 years ago, it's currently under the DSET interface. But model was, Salus was designed to account for management, you know, planting, dealing with residues, tillage, fertilizer, manure, and so on. So it's an evolution of the model that has been uh, giving good satisfaction. En relación al CERES, los cambios principales han sido eh, la incorporación de, de mejores modelados para los cultivares eh, que utilizamos hoy en día y una mejor explicación en los modelos de manejo particularmente los relacionados con el, el suelo, es decir, el agregado de residuos o eh, la simulación de, de escorrentía cuando el suelo ya está húmedo, es decir, que es un modelo derivado que tiene simulaciones que son más precisas, son más complejas eh, y mejores que las del modelo anterior que ya eran buenas. So, just briefly, the model requires input on the weather, the soil, which is basically a minimum data set, data that are highly available, um, management, whatever has been done for different crops, then has a crop engine, a soil water balance, and soil organic matter, and delivers output, and you know, anything related to partitioning of soil, evaporation, transpiration, dynamics of the soil water balance, so biochemistry and different aspects of crop yield, including grain weight, grain number, and so on. Entonces, el modelo funciona de esa manera. Tiene, would you, would you help me with, Part, uh, with the slide? Yeah. Eh, tiene una serie de, de información que se ingresa, una de clima, una de suelos, la caracterización de suelos, una serie de datos de manejo que uno puede modificar o ingresar al programa, y algunas eh, variables que son propias del cultivo. Eh, el programa entonces una vez que se ingresa esa información tiene un módulo que simula el crecimiento y desarrollo del cultivo, otro módulo que, des, que calcula las, la dinámica y, y los intercambios de, en el suelo y saca una serie de, de eh, outputs, ¿no es cierto?, que son, modela el rendimiento, modela una serie de índices como los del suelo, la cantidad de agua remanente por horizonte, ese tipo de cosas, las temperaturas de los suelos y el estado en que el suelo queda al final respecto de su eh, bioquímica, es decir, la cantidad de nutrientes y demás. So, just recently we have developed a very friendly interface that it will be, it was available for, now we, we're changing it, and it will be available for public domain off the web. So you can run simulation on the internet. Um, it has a very simple, basically a series of questions in plain English, and it just it will take no time to translate in Spanish, but how do you till your soil? When do you plant your crop? Uh, how much fertilizer do you put? Do you use organic amendments, you know, manure, compost, do you irrigate? and so on. Then the model runs and in the simplistic version you get just a, a snapshot of the ranges of variability which you, you can, you know, the worst year and the best year, the average year and a series of output that can be useful from the environmental aspect and then I developed this agronomic management sustainability index. It's not profit but it just weights 
the yield as well as nitrate leaching uh, N2O emissions and so you get a score based on how sustainable you are just mainly from the, the biophysical component. Entonces, el, el programa eh, ha, han generado un programa, una interfaz amigable. El programa va a estar disponible de manera pública desde la página de la universidad. Lo que tienen es una serie de, de ventanas donde uno coloca las, eh, los datos de manejo. Es decir, por ejemplo, puede decidir simular distintas densidades de siembra o simular una densidad de siembra con una fertilización, incluyendo puede cambiar el tipo de fertilizante, eh, la fecha de aplicación y demás. Y cuando carga todo eso, el programa entrega una simulación del rendimiento y además un índice de sustentabilidad que indica eh, una combinación de todos estos factores de qué manera repercuten en, a lo largo del tiempo. So, continuing the application that we'll develop for these farmers, which To make a long story short, they're basically capturing and commercializing it. So they're, they're basically going to use it in many, many farms. And the, 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 the system called GeoYields basically creates stability maps, the model runs, and the uniqueness is that the model runs both in a strategic way for long-term analysis of weather and real-time weather. So farmers download the weather until two days before Uh, and then they run scenarios with a probability of risk associated. It's, it's just a suggestion, but if you put a certain amount, you have this risk of getting this yield. And then I'll comment on this slide. Entonces, lo que, lo que esto permite hacer es lo siguiente. Ustedes pueden eh, simular series largas de clima de la cual se derivan datos de riesgo. Es decir, pongámosle que se, se tiene una serie de 20 o 30 años de clima con un paquete de medidas de manejo, ustedes pueden obtener una curva de riesgo que les dice cuál es la probabilidad de obtener un rendimiento u otro. Y al mismo tiempo pueden tener una manera eh, dinámica para el año en curso, es decir, pueden eh, modificar la norma de manejo y pensar en escenarios distintos que pasaría no para un estudio de riesgo de largo plazo, sino para tomar una decisión para la campaña actual. So after the, the testing process, which is a major component of the, the, the system, the, the system will not deliver output or suggestion unless the model does a good job. So after the, the validation, basically the model was run before the time. So we were in 2003, July 5th, and the model ran you know, until July, uh, like July 7th or so, or 8th. And so we simulated what would be the impact if you do a certain management strategies, and in this case was assuming it will not rain anymore, or if you apply a different amount of fertilizer, or if you're gonna ha have a, a heat spell, like it's gonna be really hot around anthesis, and so you can simulate a series of scenarios and then get a feeling. If you can implement a, ma a change in management, it's fine. If you, do, if you can't, that it's too late, at least you will know how much the, the probability of having a certain amount of yield which you can negotiate different price. So farmers appreciated the, the management component as well as the knowledge of the yield because they have to deal with storage, they have to deal when to harvest, the, the amount of energy they have to put in the silos to dry down, um, and even the prices so for commodity trading and so on. So the, um, that's, that's how it works. Entonces lo que ellos hicieron es que validaron el modelo eh, durante una serie de años y después lo que, lo que sugieren que uno pueda hacer es ir iterando o ir generando un paquete de manejo que sea el óptimo para la secuencia histórica que uno tiene y después estudiar qué pasa si uno tiene un, un evento eh, climático inesperado. Entonces... Eso no solo permite simular el, el rendimiento, sino también tomar decisiones de logística, o sea, cuánto espacio de almacenamiento voy a necesitar o cuánto combustible para secar el grano o lo que fuera. Y además de eso, eh, tener una previsión para saber qué precio uno puede querer negociar ante un evento que pueda ocurrir. I'll skip that, that's a little bit too complicated. Just another piece of technology that we use, 
which can be linked to the system is not yet, as well as the drones, but it's the electrical resistivity tomography. I just wanted to show, share this with you just because it's, for, for me it's, it's just the great things to see so much no tillage in, in the US and you would appreciate seeing that these sensors basically at one cubic resolution um, just detected the changes of different management systems. So that's a conventional, that's a minimum tillage and, and a no tillage not as long as you have. This was only seven years and you see how much differences you see the profile when we dig the pit and the uniformity of the profile and the availability of storing soil moisture. And now I'll show you why I'm, uh, our, this links into basically selection of zones. Una de las cosas que todavía no se ha implementado para el, para el software para hacer la detección de zonas estables sobre las cuales simular ha sido el uso de la conductividad eléctrica. Él está entusiasmado en el uso de esa herramienta para mapear la condición de suelo porque aún en, con una secuencia de apenas siete años de siembra directa en un lote en Estados Unidos han, no, han notado cómo la conductividad eléctrica refleja la mejoría en el estado de retención de agua de los suelos. And it will basically, people have asked, what happens if I till a no-till soil? You will lose basically 80% of what you have stored in a single year. It's not shown in this paper, but it's, it's a pretty drastic loss in one time. It's like opening a jar and you lose basically most of the carbon. But if you do one tillage event, it will just resembles what you had in the conventional tillage. So the structure and all the benefits will be lost. Entonces dice que eh, eh, una de las cosas que han conseguido simular o demostrar con esto es que la interrupción hasta de una sola campaña en eh, la siembra directa eh, se pierde prácticamente todo el beneficio de una secuencia larga y el suelo vuelve a estar como cuando se cultivaba de manera convencional. Another thing that we emphasize on the importance of managing nitrogen correctly and again, people don't necessarily want to hear about the environmental aspect. So I'm throwing this at you just as a piece of knowledge, information that agriculture is not, you know, the main sector that causes climate change, emission of greenhouse gases. Only 10%, we are responsible between 10 and 14%. But we have one or two gases that we're basically responsible for 17% of those gases. And one of it is obviously nitrous oxide, which is highly related to the uh, um, ap application of fertilizer. The reason I'm doing this is because now the supply chains in the US, the large companies like Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, Cargill, and they made a pledge of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So now they want the farmers to reduce the fertilizer application without giving them necessarily any advice or tools and. So now there is this debate that things are going to go towards the environmental aspect and there is even a more of a need to analyze the data collected over time with a system approach. Si bien la, eh, la agricultura ha sido responsable por una cantidad muy pequeña de la emisión de, de gases de efecto invernadero, eh, la aplicación de fertilizantes en la agricultura ha sido responsable de la producción de algo así como el 17% de emanaciones de óxido, de nitro, óxido nitroso, eh, lo cual sí tiene un impacto grande. Entonces, ahora, si bien hasta ahora no nos hemos preocupado de la fertilización nitrogenada desde el punto de vista ambiental, esto va a llegar, y en Estados Unidos lo están notando porque como las grandes corporaciones como Pepsi o Coca-Cola, además han prometido bajar eh, en sus actividades industriales la producción de, de gases de efecto invernadero, ahora quieren que la agricultura también tome cartas en el asunto y hagan lo mismo que hacen ellos. And so those numbers before meant that you need basically 296 molecules of CO2 to make one of N2O. And so if you see the agricultural sector, you have a certain percentage out of you know, cattle, biomass burning, but agricultural soils is 50% of the emission of N2O comes from fertilizer. 
El 60% de la, de la emisión de óxido de nitrógeno viene de la fertilización. Entonces, por ese motivo, ha, digamos, ha, ha enfocado mucho la atención el tema de regular la aplicación nitrogenada para el tema ambiental. Es still important for maintain, but mainly for rice production or livestock. So the tomography is used on the go now. You can put it behind the tractor and detect zones. So this is a quick example I want to go through. You have a tomography map that describes you know, the surface as well as the subsurface. And then you have a series of yield maps. And then we executed the model. This is a farmer's field, wheat farmer's field in southern Italy, where the farmers applied 100 kilograms of nitrogen uniformly for the last God knows when, maybe hundreds of years or more. When you talk about tomography... The tomography is like a mirror image of the yield mapping, and the tomography now is, can be mapped behind the tractor. It's tomography. I didn't correct you, but it's the inverse. Oh, sorry. They can make a tomography of the soil, and with that, ayudar a generar un mapa de zonas como ese y validar la, la bueno o comparar la diferencia entre una aplicación variable con una aplicación uniforme de nitrógeno y determinar las zonas de, de, de rendimiento mediante la simulación de esa manera. So these three zones, the model was run for I think well, like 46 years of weather data. And we concluded that if you see and it was validated. So if you see that if the farmers put more than 90 kilograms per hectare, he will increase his yield basically with 120, it's a slight increase, insignificant, but he will increase his leaching. If he goes into the low zones, which was dark and red, if he puts 30, it breaks even because it's a very, very poor, rocky, sandy, like 20 centimeters of soils. But if he does not even put a little bit of nitrogen, he doesn't get any yield. So remember, this is net revenue. The yield is like a ton or so. If you use the green zone, and basically he has to put 60. If he puts more than 60, he just loses um, both profit as well as nitrate leaching. And the important thing is to see that these three zones have a leaching potential very different to start with. Lo interesante es que al mapear las tres zonas, eh, como lo hicieron antes, se puede ver que las tres zonas no solo tienen una respuesta diferente a la, a la fertilización nitrogenada, sino también que tienen una, eh, una diferente respuesta a la lixiviación de nitrógeno. Y por encima de ciertos montos de nitrógeno, mediante la simulación poder, pudieron determinar que el nitrógeno excedente que se agregaba simplemente se lava. And so the next slide is important, but I'll try to make it as simple as possible. Basically, after you run the model, this is a rain-fed environment on no irrigation. So once uh, the farmer has to make a decision about fertilizer application, in a rain-fed environment in, in the Mediterranean, the amount of water that you have stored in the profile tells you how far you can go and how much is the minimum amount of nitrogen that will allow to make a yield. The important thing is if you put too much, plants will use the water very aggressively and may not run out of water when they have to fill the grain. So it's very complex if you don't use a system like this. For 45 years we ran and we saw that basically in the high zones, if he has more than 50 millimeter of rain, which can be counted with a pencil, knowing how much you rain, he can put up to 120. But in the low zones, if he has, you know, in the medium zone, if he has less than 50, he cannot put more than 60. So that's the response of the input, spatially, but accounting for climate variability. Entonces, eh, la, las zonas espaciales tienen eh, una, una cantidad de agua remanente al comienzo del ciclo que es distinta. Entonces, media, ellos corrieron una simulación de más de 45 años de datos climáticos y lo que pudieron determinar es la cantidad de nitrógeno que vale la pena poner según la cantidad de rama, remanente que tiene de agua cada zona en el suelo. Porque 
si la cantidad de, de nitrógeno que se agrega se agrega para eh, una cantidad de, de agua remanente en el suelo baja, la planta va a consumir el agua de manera muy, muy agresiva, pues va a crecer muy, de manera muy agresiva. Entonces, eh, digamos, el efecto de la fertilización se va a ver contrarrestado por el mayor consumo de agua. En realidad, en resumen, lo que está tratando de mostrar es que mediante la simulación y el conocimiento del comportamiento de cada una de las zonas, se puede determinar cuál es la cantidad de fertilizante óptimo a aplicar para una secuencia muy, muy larga de años y uno saber qué riesgo asume ante cada condición inicial. So, you have to bear with me, this is not as fancy as the machines that do precise, but I think this is just as important because now the farmers will have, with the commercial, with the company, will have an, an app and he knows where, where it is on this curve, how much water he has and what are the changes for his field to make a profit. Or lose money. Entonces dice que él, admitidamente, un programa como este es mucho menos glamoroso que alguna de las máquinas super electrónicas que tenemos, pero finalmente existe una, una herramienta con esto que permite al productor saber tomar la decisión sobre cuánto fertilizar según las condiciones iniciales que tiene para cada zona y saber qué respuesta puede esperar basado en una secuencia larga de años para un paquete de manejo determinado. Es decir, puede simular el manejo y teniendo la secuencia larga de años, saber si va a ganar plata o no va a ganar plata con cada dosis de fertilizante. So this is another example, I'll go quick, with the same procedure. But this was tested in the field, that's the other one. But this is on maize, three different zones. We selected area within the same zones so that they are uniform. So the model for the red zone said, you should not be putting more than 120 kilograms. And the farmers put 190. Then in the second zones, the model that had a response said, there is a response, you, you, the highest yield is given with 170 kilograms. And then in the third zone, it said they want 150, you lose profit. It may give you, you know, maybe a higher yield and so on. So these are the results haven't been published yet, we run in the paper now, on um, the field application. So in the, in the green bars, in the zone number three, the control, what he put, he made a little bit you know, higher, higher uh, yields, but he lost profit because there are 40 kilos of nitrogen more that he had to put. With the others, he, he, he would have saved a significant amount of money. This is not just one year. This is the simulation of 40 years. It's tested on that particular year. And so it captures the simulation, it captures the, the probability of the event. So if you say 75% of the time you have this response, then the model helps you saying, are you in the 75% or are you in the 25% that you could have a response? I mean, it's a little bit complicated, but you have to understand basically the model accounts for the climate variability and then Helps you select the best management strategy. Este ejemplo está hecho en maíz y tiene tres zonas también. Está validado, es decir, que se simuló y después se validó en un año y se demostró que la simulación estaba acorde con lo que ocurrió realmente. Lo que ustedes van a ver en la columna de la izquierda es la cantidad de fertilizante para cada una de las tres zonas que recomendaba el modelo poner 120 kilos en la zona 1, 170 en la 2 y 150 en la 3. Y los agricultores ponían siempre de manera uniforme 190 kilos. Ustedes pueden ver que entre 120 y 190 kilos en la primera zona y en la segunda zona, el rendimiento fue igual, entonces la simulación les permitió ahorrar mucho dinero. Y si bien en la tercera zona los 190 kilos permitieron un rendimiento un poco mayor, el, el, la rentabilidad fue menor porque la diferencia de rendimiento no compensó la, la diferencia de costo de agregar 40 kilos más. Y lo que es importante entender es que como esta simulación se hizo sobre una secuencia muy larga de años, lo que en realidad está diciendo es que hay una probabilidad de tener una respuesta cuando uno hace esto que uno puede saber cuál es. Es decir, si el 75% de los años esto se cumple, uno tiene una herramienta para saber cuál es la probabilidad de acertar con una combinación de norma de manejo determinada. So if you go back to the supply chain telling you need to reduce your fertilizer 
and they simulate a system like this, you basically, you see that the greenhouse gas emissions, the, the empty circle, increase, but the response of the fertilizer does not increase your yield. And so this is also another method of benchmarking and, and comparing the impact on greenhouse gas emissions because it's a linear, basically 1%, it's a very robust number, 1% of the fertilizer applied, it's lost by N2O. So 100 kilos lose 1 kilo. Otra manera de, de ver la, el impacto ambiental que tiene esto es que uno puede ver que eh, aumentando la cantidad de fertilizante por encima de lo necesario, no se consigue un aumento de rendimiento, pero sí se consigue un aumento de la emisión de, gaso, de, de gases de efecto invernadero, porque por cada kilo de... Hay, digamos, la relación es lineal y robusta, por cada kilo de nitrógeno... Eh, de excedente agregado hay una cantidad fija de gases de invernadero emitidos. And it's converted in CO2 equivalent, which is multiplied by 300 times the power of the gas. Ah, es 300 veces más poderoso como gas invernadero que el anhidro carbónico. So this towards the end tomorrow I will talk about my experiences in linking uh, UAV drones. Uh, that I've been working on for the last couple of years since I joined uh, Michigan State University. And there is a potential value that um, is going to be a, a straightforward presentation presenting the advantages and disadvantages. So in conclusion, it's basically a summary of all of what I have said. Precision agriculture helps you reduce the risk allowed and help you produce ecosystem services because you, you have mainly increase in energy efficiency, you in, in gain energy efficiency in production, but you also reduce, in my specific case that I presented, greenhouse gas emissions. Bueno, las conclusiones son que, se, eh, la, la que señala ahí, que se, eh, mediante la simulación, no, eh, no solo se mejora la distribución de recursos para cada zona, sino que se reducen los riesgos, eh, se aumenta la eficiencia energética de las operaciones agropecuarias, eh, se mejora la rentabilidad en general y se reduce el impacto ambiental. And furthermore, people have to realize that if you don't analyze the maps and the cropping system in a system approach, a single discipline will always leave you with a single value. Claro, a menos que estudiemos la, el rendimiento de un cultivo dentro de un, del sistema complejo de variables que lo afectan, todos los ensayos y las, los modelos que tengamos de aplicar una variable nos van a dar solamente un resultado y no nos van a permitir optimizar todas las demás variables. So the, the simulation, the system helps you basically integrate genetics, weather, soil, management to increase the profitability. I will end my talk here, but before I do, I would really like to thank uh, the organization for inviting me, mainly Mario Bragaccini, Andres Mendez, and uh, Ricardo Melchiorri, Susanna and Hale to, uh, just for their availability, disponibility, to take me around and has been um, very enlightening for me to be in Argentina. It's my second visit and I always come uh, with pleasure and also because just about half of the population is Italian. So thank you.